Um, last time we reviewed the differences between static web pages and dynamic pages. Um, static pages um, are pages that remain the same and are only changed based on someone manually going in and changing the code. All right. Whereas dynamic pages are not completed web pages, but they're instructions to create a web page in, in a nutshell. And these instructions can pull data together from a number of places to assemble a, um, a, a completed web page. And if you think about it, most of the things that happen significantly on the web are done via dynamic pages, right? Because, you know, think if you think of the, the popular websites out there, you know, Facebook, Google, eBay, Amazon, just about any of them you name, if you try to think of how it could be implemented using static pages, just plain old HTML pages, it can't, right? Any application, any web application where you log on, couldn't do static pages for that, right? Doesn't make sense. You need something to look at who the person is and make the page customized for them. So Angel has to be done via dynamic pages, all right? Um, Amazon, anytime where you have a high volume of stuff, it probably makes sense. Anytime where stuff is updated often, it probably makes sense that um, it is done via dynamic. So dynamic pages really is where it's at. It, it, it sort of changed the web from being sort of an electronic publishing system where you could put out pages um, that were informational but never changed to a more of an application platform and an application environment. So if you notice, a lot of times in class, uh, you know, I'll talk about a web application. What I mean is, is, is pages that do something. Pages that just don't sit there and look at you, but pages that go out and actually do something. So to review, if we're going to look at, if we're going to analyze, say, Google, shouldn't take too much convincing to think, gee, Google must be done via dynamic web pages. Is there a web page sitting out there for every possible search term? Of course not. That's absurd. And even if there was, how would Google know which page to display based on a request? Obviously, it would have to be something processed in, uh, in, in there as well. So, in a nutshell, the recipe is going to look like this. There's going to be the script, which is the instructions. I said last time it's sort of like the recipe for putting together the web page. There is likely to be a database. Not all web applications require a database, but most of them do because you need some persistence of data. You need to store the data somewhere. So whether you're talking about Amazon having your user information and recording your orders, or whether you're talking about Google having a directory of the Internet, or whether you're talking about eBay with products and account information and ratings and all that, there needs to be a way to store the data. And that is typically going to be via a database. All right. In addition to these two ingredients, your client is going to make a request, and that request is going to contain several things. It's going to contain the URL that the user wants, right? I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do on Google, right? There's Google Docs, there's Google Calendar, um, any number of different things. So. The URL says what you want to do. There's going to be form data. In other words, that there's a text box on the page for search, the term that you put in the search. If there is, um, if you, for example, do an advanced search, there's other form elements. There may be a drop down for language and so on. And finally, there's going to be 
a whole bunch of other request parameters. Stuff that goes along with your request sort of transparently that's just really part of the HTTP protocol, right? Web pages are requested typically using the HTTP, the HTTP protocol, and that protocol contains some information about the requester, like the IP address of that, right? Obviously, the IP address is needed because the web server needs to know who to send the request back to, all right? So that's one thing. Second thing that would be there would be things such as your platform, all right? If you've ever noticed, if you go to a page for, uh, to download software, if you're on a Mac, it will show you the link to download the Mac version. If you're on a PC, it will show you the link to, to download the PC version. So the server knows something about the person making or, or the system making a request. And so if we were to think about how this kind of thing works, all right, you get your blank form, you type in your search term and click submit, that, all that information gets to the server. The server is going to do a few things. It's going to take the script, the script is going to do these things, it's going to use your search term to query the database, but it's also going to look up your IP address somewhere, all right? might be a different database. So if you remember last time, we said there can be other stuff out here. So Google's going to look up your IP address somewhere. Again, I can't claim to know where it will, but it will look it up somewhere to get a sense of where your location is. And it will use that, along with your search term, to query the database and to come up with a search results page made just for you. So again, if you remember the example we went over last time, we searched for Italian restaurants. We did not just get any Italian restaurants. We got all Italian restaurants within this area. So that page was made custom for me. All right? And thing to keep in mind is the script is written in some server-side scripting language. The one that we're going to use in this class is ASP.NET. But that's not the only one, all right? PHP is another example. Python, Perl, Ruby on Rails, um, JSP, Java uh, uh, server pages. There's any number of different technologies that are used that can accomplish this. ASP.NET is just one of them. It's the one that is Microsoft's solution that works best um, on Microsoft's um, web server software. All right. What's the server again after all? The server is able to listen and respond to requests. So this would be a machine running, a, running server software that's waiting for requests, listening on a port for requests, and then responding to those requests. Now the important thing to remember is this is going to be written in whatever language. In our class, we're, our server side script is going to be written in ASP.NET. But the thing to remember is when the day is done, what gets delivered to the client is an HTML document. And I mean it's the stuff that clients understand. That is, it's going to be a mix of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The browser on this end doesn't know anything about ASP.NET. It doesn't need to, right? The browsers consume, the browsers are able to process HTML pages. So whatever happens on that server side, you got to be able to produce HTML code. And that's what we get on, on the client side, is they get delivered um, HTML and so on. Now a couple things to remember. This is why we can't do like we did in CISS 216, the Intro to Web Development class, and just open these scripts up in the browser, right? Because the browser doesn't know about those languages. It's going to try to interpret it as HTML, and who knows what it's going to come up with. But it's not going to be right, all right? These pages need to be served up by a web server. In other words, there's some processing that needs to take place first on the server to take that recipe 
and make a web page from it. All right? And that's what the web server software does. Um, because we have the Microsoft server and ASP.NET framework and all that stuff installed on our server, that's what the server does. Another thing to remember, just as an aside, in a larger application, I'm writing this as though this server actually accesses the database itself. Probably a better diagram for a larger system would be this being the web server accesses a database server somewhere that accesses the database. Now this database server could be the same machine as a web server or it could be a different machine. Right? I think it's important to know because a lot of times we kind of casually throw around the word server saying like that machine is the server. Well, whenever you're talking about a machine being a server, you're talking about a particular kind of transaction, a particular context, right? So it's probably more appropriate to say, in this case, this is the web server. And the web server itself can talk to the database server, which could be the same machine or it could be another machine um, if, you know, if you wanted more, more horsepower uh, there. Remember, a server is, uh, when you define something as a server, that's a role that that system is playing within a given context. You know, let's say you are uh, a customer in a restaurant. Your server is a person that's waiting on you today. The very next day, those roles could be reversed, right? That, your server from yesterday could have the day off, and you might be working in a restaurant somewhere, and you're the server, and they're the client. So when you define something as a server, you're really talking about uh, the context of a particular transaction. And in the, in the context of web uh, world, a web server listens for requests for web pages and then fulfills them. In the case of static pages, fulfilling them simply means going in and responding to them. Um, in the case of dynamic pages, there's some work that is done to actually create the page on the fly and then return it to it. Now this, in principle, is how any server-side scripting works. All right? Any server-side scripting works this way. So if, I was, if this class was in PHP, I would give an identical lecture to, to set the frame here. It's not as though those act any differently. The specifics and the mechanism and the language of the scripts in is, is different, but on a conceptual level, the same sort of thing applies. Questions at this point? Yes? You've chosen um, uh, the ASP.NET probably because it's the most common out there, but is there a better script than ASP.NET to, to write web server scripting? Well. The reason we picked uh, ASP.NET uh, for this class is not because it's necessarily the most common, but because it is a very popular scripting language. All right, so it is one of the most common platforms. Um, and in addition, um, it sort of leverages the knowledge that people have from their other classes, like the, the C-sharp class and, and, and so on. So that's probably the reason that we taught it. Um, you all know anytime you see, you know, that there, there's no such thing, or very rarely is there such a thing where we can say this is the best technology. What's the best phone? Well, I don't know. <laughs> you know? Each one of them, you could probably make a list of advantages and disadvantages of, right? What's the best computer to own? What's the best laptop? None of these things have definitive answers. So if you ask, is there a better scripting language? The, the answer would be that in, in, you know, in, in a certain context, one may be preferred over the other, but that doesn't mean it's better. It means it's, it's better for that particular context. All right? The advantage, of course, of some of the other scripting languages I mentioned is that they're multi-platform. So, for example, PHP you could run on a Linux server. Well, you can't run a, a Linux server and run ASP.NET, at least not easily. All right? Um, so if that was, if that was, you know, just like what's the best computer? Well, if your priori priority is mobility, then a laptop's better than a desktop, right? 
What's the best web scripting language? Well, if your uh, priority is you want to have a Linux web server, then ASP.NET isn't a choice. All right. Beyond that, there's advantages and disadvantages of each one. Um, PHP is definitely a very popular uh, language also, and that's why in the 232 class we teach that one. Um, Ruby on Rails is one that is increasing in popularity. Python is popular uh, among some people. Um, and then uh, the Java-based solutions are the other, uh, another big one. But again, you know, you can't really give a definitive answer to that. Right. Yeah. I'm wondering if the uh, ASP.NET would be more popular than on the smaller businesses where you wouldn't really need a bigger... I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't come to that conclusion. No. no. There's an awful lot of big websites um, that, that use uh, ASP.NET. Other questions? Yeah. We're in Sherwin Williams now, and we use ASP.NET. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I would not I would not come to that conclusion because there's always things you can do, right? You know. Um, a lot of times, you know, it's kind of funny, but a lot of times, you know, when you pick a, when you pick a platform, you're, you're in a nutshell picking which problems you want to deal with. All right, you know, so almost any problem, that, almost any solution to have is going to have issues, and then, then there's ways of getting around those issues. And, and so when you pick a solution or when you pick a path, you're essentially choosing the problems you're going to have to deal with. And, uh, again, you know... Uh, yeah, ASP.NET is very popular even among larger systems. Because there's always stuff you can do. Other questions? Yes. <laughs> um, so I was when I was reading the book, it said that we needed to download some stuff, but all we need to download is Visual Studio. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, just Visual Studio. Is so not like what they're saying in the book, but they're saying something about the Visual Press. Web Developer. Yeah, yeah, no, that's an earlier that's an right. earlier thing. Yeah, that's that's a problem. Um, Picking textbooks in this class is tough because the the versions change so quick, right. yeah. and uh, and then you know there, usually there's a, you know there, there's it's not like each version is like a brand new start, but there's new things and sometimes the screens look differently and all that and so yeah uh, I decided to, to to deal with the you know to, to to be able to address the the version question because I like a lot of the other aspects of the book. But yeah, Visual Studio is what you need. And probably 2012 or 2013. Yeah, um, yeah, 2012 is fine. Okay. Question. Um, the script sends back HTML to the client. Which version of HTML is it using, or can you set that? Or? Well, it, w whatever version the script is is meant to write. All right. So in other words, when you write the remember, you control the script. It's not like the script is like a product of the robot uprising and it's doing stuff on its own, right? So if you write a script that outputs HTML5, then it'll send HTML5. If you write a script to send HTML4.01, it will send HTML4.01. So you define what it, it, uh, it returns. Um, the other question that I get sometimes is sort of a different flavor of that same question is are there browser compatibility issues with the ASP.NET page? And the answer, of course, is, well, it depends. Do you, are you writing a script that produces HTML that contains browser compatibility uh, issues? If so, then yeah, it's going to have browser compatibility issues. All right. Just think of this as, you know, this sort of a metaprogramming. Instead of writing the HTML page, you're writing a program to write the HTML page. So it's still under your control, you know. Um, the other thing, and I might as well say this right now, so you know, uh, so you know not to say this. All right, is um, I, I really don't like when people say ASP.NET did this or Visual Studio did this. <laughs> you know, um, you know what, what's the old saying? It's 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 a bad carpenter that blames a hammer or something <laughs> something like that, right? Uh, you're the one using the tool, all right? So this is your code, all right? You're getting the grade in this class, all right? In the real world, you're getting the paycheck, all right? Not Visual Studio. Visual Studio doesn't get a grade for this class, doesn't get the paycheck. 
it's a tool for you to do things, but it is your code and your responsibility to make sure that it works. And if it doesn't do something the way it ought to, it's your job to fix it. All right? It just, you know, it's, it's how it is, you know. Other questions about this? I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to add. I don't think so. All right. Now we're going to get more. Oh, there was one, one last thing. On the notion of client-side scripting. Again, the emphasis in this class is server-side scripting, but a thing to keep in mind is that in addition to scripts being able to run on the server, typically that client is also a computer as well. Or if not a computer, it's a tablet or a smartphone. It has some processing power as well, so it can do stuff as well. All right? It's not like a dumb terminal from the 70s. All right, where it's just displaying stuff. So, part of the package that gets delivered to the client is some JavaScript. And the JavaScript is, or the JavaScript gives the ability to make some small changes to the page without having to go back to the server. Let's look at a couple examples of JavaScript, or let's look at one example of JavaScript in, in action, then we'll look at another example that probably will seem confusing if you try to apply this model to it. As we go through here, and as we put our mouse over these things, notice how the menu underneath it, the submenu underneath it changes. Notice how that happens virtually instantaneously. All right. We can conclude from that that this is probably done via client-side scripting. Why? Because if, if this was done via server-side scripting, it would have to make put a request all the way through the internet to the server and come back. It would not really be able to work instantaneously. Now we have a fast internet connection, but even on a slower internet connection you get the same effect. So therefore, as such, this is an example of client-side scripting. So along with the HTML, there's code that changes these menus and makes some of them visible, some of them invisible based on where you put your mouse. So that's an example of client-side scripting. All right. What do you suppose is going on here? I'm doing a Google search, and as I'm typing in, it's showing me a list of things. OK. The statement is made that it has to be done on the server side. All right? And that's a valid statement. Obviously, something's going on on the server side, right? Because my client doesn't have Google's database to know what the most popular search terms are that start with the letters ASP. All right? Yet, it sure doesn't look like the page is being refreshed completely. And it sure isn't 
rewriting the whole page. All right. Typically, when you make a request to the server, the entire page, you're getting back a, a whole HTML page. Yes? Isn't that what Ajax is? This is exactly what Ajax is. And what Ajax is, is a mix of clients and server-side scripting in a different manner that allows you to get some data from, take advantage really of both, both server and client-side scripting. So it gets some data back from the server, and it uses client-side scripting to reformat the web page. All right. So in other words, if I type in ASP.N, ET space W, every keystroke is asking the server, what are the most common search terms for that? And it's getting back not a complete web page. Notice this page doesn't like flicker when it gets redrawn, like typically when you go from link to link it does. You know, like if we were to go here, notice, boom, it goes, or here, boom, we see the page close and a new one open. Here what happens is, seamlessly, it displays the new content. So it's getting the data from the server, the client side is formatting it. So this is a more sophisticated, more nuanced communication between the client and server. Instead of requesting the whole page, getting it back, the client is making little requests to the servers, getting chunks of data back, and then the client is rewriting that. Towards the end of the semester, we'll probably look at some uh, of, the, of the, the aspects of uh, Ajax that are in the ASP.NET framework. Because it is valuable. This makes web pages act more like um, regular applications as opposed to the clunky earlier versions of web uh, interfaces where every request got back a, a completed web page. Yes? So as far as the server side goes, does it, so it stores a mass amount of data mm -hmm. and it also stores scripts that kind of are instructions on how to construct that data as the web page is being pushed back to the client. Exactly. And on the client side, there's also some additional potential scripting that allows you to format yeah, exactly. the final product of how that looks. Exactly. The, 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 again, going back to this diagram here, the uh, server contains, uh, in addition to the database, the raw data, or a connection to a database server, it contains the scripts. And the scripts are what figures out what it needs to do to, to pull up the data. So, again, in the case of Google, remember it takes a number of factors into account. It takes your search term, it takes your location, probably even takes your platform like whether you're on a, on a Mac or on a Windows uh, environment or whatever, and pulls all these factors together, accesses the database to create that. You know, it's really amazing when you think about all the things that, that happen. I mean, you know, that, that each time you make a request for this, this page is made for you on the spot as opposed to, you know, something that's sitting out there. So every request you type into Google, you're getting results geared just for you. Two people typing in that same thing might get subtly different results depending on any number of different factors. Because it sort of remembers what you've typed in before, too. Yeah. Right? You know? Yep. Because I can type in that and I might not get the same as you're getting right now. Yep. Yeah. And people even talk about it um, in, um, you know, and, and this is not a, a class in politics, certainly. But people even talk about like the political or social implications for this. If you are in a, quote, liberal state, you're liable to get different results when you do a query than if you're in a conservative state, which is kind of kind of scary, regardless of, what your, regardless of what your politics are. It's kind of odd that, that you know. And, and I don't think the people at Google do this in a sinister manner. It's not like, oh, we're going to control your thought or anything like that. <laughs> I think their job is to create the best results for you, but that comes at a cost, right? That comes at, at um, you know, th there's a potential downside to that as well, I guess is what I'm saying. There's a good book written about that. I forget what it's called, but I just, I read it like, uh, I think in the spring. Yes.